Hey, what's going on, everyone? And welcome to the latest edition of the Panel Beat Podcast. I'm Alex Shankowski, joined by Julian Edlow, Steve Buchanan, both raring to go. Yes, sir. Sure. All righty, then. <laughs> We're going to talk uh, quite a bit of baseball. we got some basketball. We've got some uh, fake football that you play on, on the television. Um, starting, of course, though, with the most important thing... Um, Apparently, Area 51's getting raided. I don't know if you heard about this. You see this? Uh, that's the word on the street. Uh, kind of had us thinking here a little bit about front offices in professional sports. If you could raid any place to find out its secrets, where would you go in the world of sport? What do you want to find out? Definitely going to the Red Sox front office. Why did you trade for this idiot Andrew Kashner? He's probably a pretty smart guy. No, I mean, I, that has to be one of the worst trades. I mean, I, I, they gave up a couple seventeen-year-olds and basically cost them nothing. Andrew Kashner is not going to give you anything for this club. He is horrific. He's terrible. And we saw it last night. He can't even get through the Blue Jays. I mean, I know you're a big Blue Jays fan, so it must have given you some pleasure to see that their big acquisition, Andrew Kashner, could not even get through start through the Blue Jays and their potent in offense. I, I don't get it. Yeah. I, 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 they can't be done making deals, obviously, if they're going to be. Oh, they said they're competing. probably done. They, oh. they think that they're probably done. Dave Dombrowski, this genius, this guy that we had to bring in, <laughs> thinks that he's done now for the trade deadline. Andrew Kashner was was the piece that they needed. I don't get why this is the one thing you want to know. Like, you can know <laughs> anything in sports, and yep. it's like, why did the Red Sox trade for a really solid fifth starter that can eat up innings? Andrew Kashner's nine and four with a four oh nine ERA. He made four starts in June with a one four four ERA. Cool. You gave up, as you said, nothing to get him. Okay. I'm not saying Andrew Kashner's great. I'm saying like that's a fine back piece of the rotation. There's three things we need to know about in this world. Who shot JFK? <laughs> Watergate. Kashner. I disagree with the third thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, but well, I, I'm just trying to think what it would be like. You know, you come in that old Area 51 arcade game. You know, kind of guns blazing, and then it's just Dave Dombrowski sitting there, like thought it made the team better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we're done. <laughs> Buchanan just turns around and walks home. <laughs> I, I, it might be because I have like a personal vendetta against him. Uh, do you think? <laughs> uh, he has lost me some money in the daily fantasy sports realm. Andrew Kashner, just real quick, at least prior to the trade, most profitable pitcher in baseball this season. BS. If you bet on him, if you bet on, if you bet a hundred dollars on Bro. the money line every Andrew Kashner start he made in Baltimore, you would be up thirteen hundred dollars. Where did you get that information from? I can't tell you that because it's not real. It's real. There's no way. How is that serious? I don't want to. I don't want to plug anybody else. Give anybody else any time here. I just know that it's real. Do they have a check mark? Yes. Idiot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good baseball gambling podcast um, out of Las Vegas. I'm a guest from time to time, so you know it's oh, legit. Oh, here we go. <laughs> you don't have a check mark. I don't need a check mark. Everybody <laughs> trusts me. I'm a man of the people. Spoken, Spoken a man God. as a man who once had a check mark, opted to, to lose opted it. Opted to have it. That was very uh, noble of you, sidebar. Jacko. It's sidebar. Very noble. Was it that important to change the username? To lose the check mark in the process? The uh, see, here's the thing. The username was from a time where I was I, I was a writer. I was a reporter. I was writing articles. I, I had bylines it. in publications. I currently don't. Uh, you know, I get to what to be on flex. podcasts such as this, and I love it. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I felt I was it was disingenuous to the profession of of journalism. So you know, I opted to change it, and I lost the check. Not like I ever really deserved the check in the first place. It was just our uh, our company wide initiative to give everyone one. I got a lot of like. Uh, British DJs started following me right after I got the check, Whoa. thinking that I was somebody important. <laughs> Not, uh, and 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 life after the check is very liberating. I, I, there's no pressure. There's you know, I'm Happy just I'm you, just man. another guy out there. Luckily, not someone just yelling at professional athletes. I would say, I mean, if if there is ever a like company man, it is Alex. He lost the check mark to just. Do what he's doing now. You're coming with me to my next performance <laughs> review, then. <laughs> That's uh, fine. We're getting off track here, though. Edlo, your Area 51 scenario in professional sports is? Patriots. It's easy. You want to find out everything going on behind closed doors in New England. Um, Deflategate, everything Belichick-related, uh, Malcolm Butler-related, um, just everything. Like, what? 
uh, how Belichick's you know thought process works, what Brady and Belichick are like in person, particularly during that whole deflate gate thing. Oh, you'll have to go ask the quarterback that, and Brady taking that four game suspension for the team, the Malcolm Butler. Super Bowl benching is another thing that obviously comes to mind, and uh, probably a bunch more things that I'm not even thinking of. They're the most interesting organization in sports, probably, to like, like, wouldn't everybody love the Patriots to be on hard knocks? And they're obviously never going to do that, but I just think they have the most to, most to hide. That's yeah, fair. similar to that. I mean, mine would be like the 76ers medical staff for like a five-year stretch there where every single draft pick was breaking some limb uh, and then never coming back. Uh, I'd be very interested to know what exactly was going on there. Uh, it's an interesting debate, though. I mean, um, let us know your thoughts as well as to wh- where you would want to go and what you would want to see. And in all likelihood, it would be very disappointing, just like this proposed Area 51 raid likely would be. Um but at least Steve Buchanan got to talk about, you know, get that Andrew Kashner uh, bug out of the way. All right, well, there's one other thing I want to know. <laughs> all, right, all right, we're not done. <laughs> there was a time where the, so supposedly Manny Ramirez threw down this old man because he wouldn't give him tickets to a game. Yep. And I think that was fabricated because nobody disrespects Manny Ramirez like that. And if he threw him down, he'd probably deserve it. I don't care if he's an old man. Should Wait, are we Manny talking is... about like the Yankees, uh, Don Zimmer, or whoever no, it was? That no, he... this, this was like the traveling secretary, whatever the hell that means, on Costanza? the Red Sox. And okay. supposedly <laughs> he wouldn't get Manny his tickets, so Manny like got mad at him and threw him down. So I want to know, A, if that Correct. actually happened, and B, if it did happen, he probably deserved it, old man or not. I mean, get this Manny has been tickets. talked about on at the time on Boston Sports Radio a good amount. Of, like It's pretty widely considered that it did happen. Okay, I just want the facts. That's all. Sure, I, mean, Old I man. can't give you the facts. But. That's, that's why I'd want to find out. <laughs> Just like you talked about the flake gate. Yeah. Uh, I think we talked That'd about it that extensively. Yeah. So I, I mean, again, I probably wouldn't wouldn't burn my bullet here on <laughs> finding out about Manny Ramirez fighting an old man in 2007, but this yeah, I mean, personal bullet for their me, own. So. Just a personal bullet. Hey, you know, it's your life. You got to live <laughs> that's it. Right, exactly. That's uh, all. Well, part, it, part first of, of all, <laughs> let it be known, he, he burned the bullet on why trading for Andrew Kashner. <laughs> this is if he was given a second chance. Now it would be Manny Ramirez fighting an old man. I'm pretty pissed off about this trade. It's like, you know, we won the World Series last year. I don't care. Uh, here we go. Blue Jays fan over here. <laughs> well, yeah, I've been waiting some time, let me tell you. Uh, part of the reason we're talking about fake scenarios that will never happen. Um, so Glenn Sparkman last night. <laughs> good transition. What exactly happened? How? Wild. I mean, it was a good matchup, I know, but... I, I I mean it was a good it, uh, it was an okay matchup and I'll say okay because you go you look at what Sparkman has done you know I'm done in air quotes it's been horrible I mean he's been something that you've been looking to pick on all season long I mean it, the highest salary he's had was fifty seven hundred this season and I'm pretty sure that was on a showdown slate so that doesn't even really count I mean he's priced like a reliever every single start he has and there's a reason for that. Doesn't go deep in the games. Doesn't have a lot of strikeout upside, but then he goes a complete game shutout last night. Eight strikeouts, only five hits allowed. I, he said that it was the longest he's ever gone in a game, which I wonder if that includes like Little League because that's like a six-inning game. But it was just on a slate where there was so many bad pitching options, he wasn't even a consideration like to anyone. So for him to like go out and score 41.6 DK fantasy points, it's just like the ultimate troll job. Uh, on a slate where pitching was, you were desperate for someone to throw up a good game last night. I feel like Sparkman's been kind of good. No. Like, he hasn't been bad, but it's just that he doesn't no. have the volume. Like, he doesn't get the innings and he doesn't get the strikeouts when he's in there. But, like, he hasn't been so he's a not bad fantasy pitcher. Relevant. Yeah, he's not a good fantasy pitcher. I just right. feel like he hasn't been a bad actual pitcher in the role that the Royals have put him in but yeah, the, he's solid at home so maybe he's a little underpriced at, at 4300 but you never expect a guy to go 10x value in, in MLB like no. <laughs> that for the most part just doesn't happen so it was obviously it's going to be one of the one of the best value performances of the season when it's all said and done easily and it's not like the White Sox are a bad offense and they're not great but it's like this is like you'd expect a start from this to happen against like the they just Marlins. have no but they have no lefties like right and, and no I think that's, that, very and that's true. a big part of it and, yep. and why you know right handers are, are going to have a little bit more uh, success against them and you know hearing from uh, the powers that be I think we're starting to get some resolution on on area 51 gate here and Jake McCormick <laughs> the name of the traveling secretary that Andy Ramirez oh. apparently threw down so we well, even have a name. 
I- I'm going to reach out to him and ask him if he deserved it or not. Yes, find him on LinkedIn. Seems very uh, <laughs> seems like a very uh, uncommon name there. <laughs> But yeah, that, that was just wild last night by Sparkman. I, I was just, you know, like I said, like, it was really difficult to pick out two pitchers you like to begin with. Drew Pomerantz had a pretty good game last night, too, as well at Coors Field. Coors and the Rockies right now, like, the Giants, they had the doubleheader on Monday. Yeah. 19 runs in the first one, and then yep. beat them again. Uh, it was a close game, but still, the Rockies just aren't scoring. No. Do we trust them again? Tonight or today, this afternoon, or I don't think so. I mean, at this point, it's like you know they're going to come back around. I mean, you don't play in Coors Field and continue to struggle no matter who you are. And that's why the totals are always so inflated, regardless of who's out there. I mean, I think it was the Marlins, I want to say, was out there earlier this season. Even those games had like a double-digit run total. Well, and look at the I mean, the Giants, too. I mean, the, right. the, the Giants are an awful offense, and they've been there twice this year, and they've right. you know crushed it both times they've been out I mean, there. And Pomeranz, I mean – Lefties, Colorado, one of the highest strikeout rates against left-handed pitchers, so you see some upside there. But One thing that I did see last night, and it makes a lot of sense, is that Pomerantz has been really staying away from his curveball, and that's what's been giving him the most trouble. And now that he's kind of gone away from that, you just look at the results. I mean, one run last night, four in his prior start against the Cardinals wasn't that great, but then you look at the rest, zero, two, seven. That was a bad one. Zero, zero. <laughs> But it was just like, if that's what's f- kind of fixings for Pomerantz. I mean, let's not forget, a couple of years ago with the Athletics, he was an all-star. Like, he made the all-star team. He, he wasn't always this punching bag that we've come to know him. But if the curveball is what was really messing with his game and he's starting to get away from that, like, he could be a pretty decent pitcher down the stretch here. I mean, we saw it last night. The Rockies just absolutely stifled them through five innings at Coors Field in a game that had a 14-and-a-half run projection. I mean, with Pomerantz, the thing that I noticed going into that start at Coors was that he just hasn't been that good on the road. Oh, A lot of those starts sure. where he's gotten blown up have been on the road. Yep. Um, so that, for me, was a stay-away spot in terms of, like, the Giants have been a great bet recently and almost always offered it plus money, and they've gotten really yeah. hot, so... The Pomerantz one, once we got around to Pomerantz on the road, I saw a spot maybe to start laying off the Giants and yep. let's just see how this one goes. And from a DFS perspective, didn't have any interest in Pomerantz. Um, and he obviously disputed that that notion and, and maybe he starts to get onto something now. And maybe it's because of the pitches that you're, that you're talking about here. But the road has been the real problem for him. So if his – whether it's issues with him just in other ballparks or his, his pitch selection – if he can kind of turn things around on the road here, he's been he's been pretty good at AT and T Park. So if he can Oracle, turn that around, Oracle Park, oh, they changed it? it again. Yeah, yeah well, I know he's been good in San Francisco, <laughs> um, <laughs> in the Bay, in the Bay. Well, you could just say so, the Bay in general because uh, he was good in Oakland as well. So there you go. True. That covers all the bases. Yeah. So he didn't throw a single curveball in that start last night. Well, and that's that's been a pitch that, like I said, he's relied upon. Well, and heavily. any, I mean, that's the other thing that's been documented too. Any breaking pitch at Coors Field, oh, at of altitude course, yeah, is, of course, you're asking for trouble because right. it's not gonna, it's not gonna have the help of gravity. Uh, it's not going down as much. Um, one other thing to mention, obviously, of course, odds and lines they are subject to change. If you are see website for actual odds. If you or someone you know has a gambling issue and would like help, please call one eight hundred Gambler. We're going to shift gears here a little bit to the to the NBA, uh, so Julian feels a little bit more comfortable <laughs> talking some basketball. I feel more comfortable talking about tonight's MLB bets than talking about what's happened in the past, because those ones, I've, I've been cold lately. Now I'm going <laughs> to heat things up. I don't like talking about the past in MLB right now. He's, he's like an well. NHL goalie. He's like a goalie, you know, short memory. <laughs> onto the next Once I, exactly. all, I, all I have to do is see one go in, and then they start piling up. <laughs> Catch fire. Uh, well, a heck of a transition, because we're going to talk about a guy who... When we get to 20, 25 feet, uh, you're not seeing a lot go in, and that's Ben Simmons. Doesn't matter because he just signed a five-year, $170 million contract. Um, some incentives as well for things like uh, all NBA teams and trade kickers and whatnot. Uh, but your initial reaction, then Julian, we'll start with you. Your initial reaction to this trade, given all of the deficiencies that are there, there's obviously upside and obviously a lot of skill, but also in today's NBA to not shoot a single, not make a single three-pointer is ridiculous. Yeah, Simmons is always going to be overvalued for as long as he doesn't work on his shot. Um, And it's not even that he doesn't 
make but them right now. But he is working on it, right? Well, like, sure, like for the working, past three years. He keeps working on it, but then he doesn't attempt anything. So, like, how long? What is this, like, a five-year <laughs> well, five plan? Again, the plan? Sixers, I mentioned, I want to see their medical staff. All right, just get me in the whole building. What it's are true. they te- Like, what is he? I've seen video. You see Twitter videos of him for the past three years shooting threes at practice. Like, Right, so when you do that, then there. you start, you know, almost <laughs> immediately transitioning that into the game generally um so this is like is what is this like ben simmons five-year plan of create developing a jump shot before he unveils it in a game <laughs> like it's ridiculous at this point well, so secure the bag <laughs> yeah <laughs> is he start. yeah now i mean now he's gotten paid he can do whatever he wants but um he's a very valuable player and he's surrounded with talent and surrounded with shooting which can blanket it a little bit people you know defend him like you would defend rondo you know in his prime except he would at least attempt some shots and hit them from time to time um it's just such a such a hole in his game to be able to play like people it was i think it was a video of lebron and ben simmons lebron was in the paint defending ben simmons when ben simmons was dribbling at the three point line yeah. Yeah, that's how the that Celtics just hurts team. your whole. That hurts your whole team because now LeBron can get a rebound. LeBron can double somewhere else. Like unless you make yourself a threat, Simmons is athletic. He can score in the paint. He's got handle. He's a great rebounder. Uh, um, he obviously is a good distributor. Um, if he would just start taking shots, it would make him so much better of a player. That said, I would not want to lose him if I'm the Sixers. So I would pay him because. They already have the pieces around them that they need. Like at this stage to win the East, they're not going to need to add anything else. Their starting five is huge. They have with with Harris, Simmons, Embiid, Horford. There's four guys right there between six nine and seven one. Mm. And then Josh Richardson at the two guard is their small guy. He's a, at least six six, right? Six five maybe at the we can look that up. Six five six six. Facts. Uh, we'll say. Yeah, we don't. We don't. Come over to, six feet. You don't come to the panel B pod for the facts, but wow. Uh, they're, they're, um, Remember, guys, when I said about journalism and how I changed my Twitter handle. <laughs> come here for hot takes, why. strong opinions. Um, uh, that lineup is going to be very yeah. difficult for uh, a Bucks team. You would think would be their prime competition. Celtics, Pacers, whoever else in the East. Defending NBA champions. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Nobody cares about the Raptors anymore. <laughs> but that's uh, that's going to be a tough lineup for anyone to defend. I, I personally think that the Sixers are going to come out of the East the way things stand. I mean, that team is set, right? Like, they've, they've made the moves now. They've signed the deals. That team is set mm-hmm. now for the foreseeable future if yeah. he can take that next step, right? Would you say that he is the guy that's going to have to take them over that next step? Embiid, we know what he is. Like, how much more ceiling is there with Embiid's game? And well, go ahead. I just think, real quick on Embiid, he just needs to, you know, get a little bit more into it just in terms of his, not development, but just work ethic, I guess. Like, he could be in a little better shape. He could be a little bit more dominant than he is. Like, we saw how Giannis dominated last season. Embiid, with the ability to shoot the three better than Giannis, like, I think Embiid could be a little bit more dominant, but with the addition of Horford now playing off the two of them, both yep. of those guys, huge, great defenders, can knock down threes. Like that's going to be tough. Yeah, but Embiid is always like because of the way the injuries started. Like he's never going to take on the workload that you would expect. Like he's o- they're always going to manage his workload. I would say Simmons. There's just still so much unknown. Well, that's why I thought the Horford deal was so huge for an Embiid. Um, standpoint and you know Julie and I kind of touched upon this before too but like Embiid always had so much trouble against Horford when they played each other like that was one of the guys that like you always consistently saw gave Embiid trouble and now he's gonna learn from this guy for like what what four years that Horford signed for Horford signed yeah four one oh nine one oh six. I mean you're getting Embiid in his prime years and now you're gonna have Horford in his ear for those, you know, that amount of time. Like, the Sixers just have such a ridiculous core for the next four or five years. Like, they are just set and stacked. Like, the other thing is that maybe two of the most well-equipped guys to cover Giannis are Al Horford and Joel Embiid. the same team, yeah. Um, Which I think is going to do a lot for now with the Raptors out of the mix. And those, you know, at least according to odds, being the clear-cut two favorite teams to come out of the East, having those two guys to defend Giannis and throw at him I, I think gives them a, a big boost in a, in a head-to-head playoff series 
Yeah, and I wouldn't sleep on Josh Richardson either. You know, coming yeah. coming over from that trade, given that they lost Reddick, um, you know, and uh, depth being what it is, like it doesn't matter in the NBA at all. <laughs> Once you get, you just gotta get to the postseason in the East. You're gonna get in the postseason. Well, They're gonna have home court advantage. with how the how free agency kind of transpired and all the madness. Like that has to be one of the most overlooked trades of this offseason, right? Like when you really think about it, with everything that's kind of gone down. I feel like Richardson's going to be such a difference maker, but people don't even think about that because of what's happened with Westbrook, what's happened when with Kawhi. And it's also overlooked because the headline of the trade is Jimmy Butler going to the Heat. Sure. So, Very true. Yeah, and that move is, I don't know. Like, I mean, the East is open like we talked about, but with everyone pairing up and everyone, you know, forming these dynamic duos, that's why everyone thought, you know, they make a play for Russell Westbrook. And maybe they did. But now that Heat team is just, I mean, Whiteside's gone. Uh, what Interesting are you looking at? <laughs> decision by Jimmy Butler to. <laughs> I, I think he loves it, though, right? Like, all we know about Jimmy Butler in terms of, you know, wanting to be that alpha and, and wanting, I, obviously, he wants to win, but clearly there's a part of Jimmy him Jimmy Butler's wants to been be trying to go to Miami forever. The Heat have been trying to trade Josh Richardson for Jimmy Butler for like two years, and they finally <laughs> got it done. And Jimmy Butler keeps saying that he wants to get, like, Jimmy Butler's a Miami guy. Like, he just seems like Tax a fit free. for the city of Miami. So I, I don't know how much of a winning move it was by Jimmy Butler to choose Miami, but we know that Miami's been on his radar for a while, and then he kind of comes up with, well, I saw how they you know, treated Dwayne Wade and how they sent him off, and that's why I want to be in Miami. It's Minus like, well, the fact that Wade got mad and signed with Chicago. We'll, we'll that freeze too. over that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't yeah. – it's, it's a non-relevant basketball move, but – well, that's and that's why it's going to be underrated, right? Like, not every move involving a superstar, every other move involving a superstar, made some team like, mm-hmm. you know, miles better, and not the case with the Heat. Right. Uh, so there's not a whole lot in the news these days. <laughs> as we're, st- <laughs> I guess we while we were talking about the NBA, I guess we we haven't touched on the one big move that's happened was the Westbrook trade since the last sure last time that we talked. So. That, that was something that didn't make much sense to no. me. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like a four or five seed in the West and the probably one, out in the first round. The one thing that I think keeps it from being a complete disaster is the fact that Russell Westbrook, who is does not have many friends in the NBA, <laughs> is very close with James Harden from their OKC days. So they like and respect each other's games. However, when how those two players how those two no. players have developed since playing alongside, <laughs> right. they have the two highest usage rates in the NBA over the last five years. Like these are the two most ball dominant players in the NBA by a mile. Um, and if you want a guy next to Harden, it's like an elite defender, knockdown three point shooter. Russell Westbrook is the worst high volume shooter in NBA history of guys that have taken. I think like over 2,500 threes in their career, he shoots the worst percentage at, at just slightly above 30. Wow. So he is the worst high volume three point shooter in NBA <laughs> history. Um, and now that's who Harden's kicking the ball to. So I think that the, the ball needs to be in Westbrook's hands right. to either get to the paint and do what he does best scoring at the rim and or we, kick to Harden. <laughs> and so we now is Harden going to be a classic <laughs> shooting guard just to catch and shoot? Like, he's not going to be okay with that. And we wonder why Ben Simmons doesn't, like, openly chuck threes in games because then it's like, well, then you're going to get the reputation that Russell Westbrook has. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, like, uh, and the funny thing is when, when OKC went to the finals that one time against the Heat, uh, they did have Kevin Durant, obviously, as well. When Harden was coming off the bench, Harden was playing the – you can call it point guard. He was the ball handler when he came into the game and Westbrook was playing off the ball. So that's kind of different than maybe I would expect the roles to be this time around. So maybe they have to learn to play together uh, again with maybe Westbrook being a little bit more ball dominant than Harden. I just think it's going to be a really weird... I don't get how it's a better fit than Chris Paul, even though Westbrook is a superior talent. Well, I guess I could see it in the... Uh, in the eyes of a Mike D'Antoni offense where Chris Paul, maybe not at that age, you know, he wasn't as running gun. Russ Westbrook's going to pr- push the pace. They'll definitely fly down the court. Uh, so you get that. Um, from a DraftKings perspective, though, I mean, you're talking about two players consistently at the upper echelon of pricing. Right. How do you navigate that? I mean, it, obviously there's going to be a wait and see and the price will fluctuate. But yeah. 
No. What, what are your impressions as to how that'll play out? Yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up because that's the one of the coolest ways to to look at it, especially for for us, is there have been you know we've gotten used to those stretches over the last three four years where you look up and and if they're both hot Westbrook and Harden could both be thirteen thousand dollars and if you they're... couldn't afford to fade them right it's I mean it, stacking them would be tough at times hopefully you scatter them on different yeah. nights <laughs> it, it, but it's like, more or less they usually were but the point right, is but like if if, yeah. like there would be times where if one of them's playing and they're on you know a six seven game triple double streak it's like okay we start with Harden or you start right. with Westbrook and you go from there. That just can't happen. There's no way. There's one ball. You can't get that many numbers. I know that's like an old school expression. Like no, we got one we, ball, we finally brought a fact to the panel <laughs> yeah. B podcast. There's one basketball. There's one basketball, there's in, one basketball in NBA <laughs> games. Um, so it's just going to be impossible for them to get those numbers. So we're going to have to like watch some games and see where their salaries level off. But I will say, given their reputations, I think at the beginning of the season, both of those guys will be good fades because they'll be priced closer to where we have once seen them and then after five six seven games we'll see what they actually are are they like is Harden a eleven thousand dollar player and Westbrook's a ten thousand dollar player when they both start the season at 12 or like where is it going to wind up being but both of them are going to have to be priced down from where we've seen them in the past good luck playing those uh that team in showdown too <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when that comes but around, I think it's gonna add captain one. <laughs> it's gonna add some entertainment to it. Like I mean, oh, it's sure. similar like when you have the Dodgers at Coors Field last year in the NBA. Roster construction just wasn't as fun because it was like, yeah, you had to start with one of those guys yeah. because from a raw points perspective, you just weren't getting that production anywhere else. And then, and then you have you know X whatever the amount of money was lo- much lower, and then you're just finding the value guys. You know, this time at least there's a little bit more decision that'll go into it. And, you know, now with all of these duos, that's going to happen a lot. It's going to be back when, uh, you know, Boogie and, and AD were together. And we were trying to figure that out a couple of years ago and ended up, they kind of coexisted pretty well. And now uh, have the chance to do so again. Yeah. Eh, well, Boogie will yeah. have to work his way. <laughs> I don't know. JaVale McGee, uh, quite the bounce back season last year. Mm-hmm. So it'll, it'll take some minutes away. But. It'll just be, um, yeah, I mean, it will be really interesting to see which of these duos complement each other versus take something away from each other. So, For we'll, sure. We'll have to see. Uh, <laughs> Madden ratings? I see you got them up on your computer. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's mid-July, so. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of where I was going to go with uh, there's not much else to talk about. Yep. And I don't, I don't, for the love of me, think we need to dive into these, if only just to say, why is this a thing again, if not a just purely commercial <laughs> play to get people interested in the game? I mean, props to EA. I think it's EA Sports who makes mm-hmm. um, Madden. Props to them <laughs> for creating a debate and a buzz about their game. because it Props is to EA for, sni- for sniffing out, uh, was it... 2K or ESPN football, whatever it was, like 15 years ago, like another video game about the NFL <laughs> that was kind of cool and yeah. different. And then they said, no, we're going to own the NFL. And they've pushed it forward to they have this, you know, synergy where, yeah. I, I mean, so it's much like faux uh, responses. It, it's a legitimate gripe with players. It's a legitimate gripe with uh, football players. It's a legit, legitimate gripe with video game players. And it's just. You know, I'm going through the list here, and you know, nothing really is like, that bad. Like, I understand, like, if you're a player, a football player, and you see yourself lower than other players that, you know, you might have some beef with or whatever. Like, I get that, but nothing no, is the just, worst. The worst are the guys that they have to put at the bottom because there has to be some kind of <laughs> balance to these, right? Yeah, like, you right. can't have everyone be above a 70. Right. And you, the backup long snappers who, <laughs> because they have to weigh, you know, to get them to 48 or whatever their rankings are, their awarenesses are like 30. Right. <laughs> and it's like an insult because usually these are the guys who are actually the sharpest people because they were focusing on getting their college degree as well because they know they're not going to be in the NFL that long. So, I mean, there's definitely some some players that I question. Like, Damian Williams is an 80. That just seems way too low for him. I think he's going to be like a pinnacle point of that Chiefs offense this year, especially if Tyreek Hill is suspended for sure. Kareem Hunt's gone. I mean, that's the same as C.J. Anderson, right. which seems high. C.J. Right. Anderson just has a lot of hype from from his time with the Rams. Yeah, and he's filling gonna, in for – From admittedly for just gaining weight and becoming a yeah. bowling ball. <laughs> I did see you scroll past Ben Watson in 82 at tight end. He's oh, I didn't even see no, that one. No, that's his age. 
<laughs> he's yeah, got ben a, Watson he's got a suspension going on. Um, he's coming off an Achilles tear. And he's tear. very old. He's the I, oldest player in the NFL. That we seems pretty weird, but I don't like. I used to be a pretty big Madden player, like in college, for a couple years after. I haven't played in probably psh, at yeah. least five, six years. So. Once it became clear these are just roster updates that you're paying for every single <laughs> yeah, year. Yeah, exactly. I, don't, I, I guess I don't have much of an opinion on the on the actual ratings. My favorite part of the ratings so far was before the show when Steve Buchanan was looking at the positions and said, "Am I an idiot or am I not seeing running back?" <laughs> and I said, "There's the halfback position." <laughs> Right there, which clearly means running back. And Listen, I had a long night last night. I'm not going to get into it's it. Not my fault. Your car died. Just give. You, thanks. <laughs> For the record, I, I drive a pretty nice car. It's not that bad. It's just <laughs> left my headlights on last night. Okay. Ta- by the way, but just real quick, uh, Tom Brady at. Um, oh, where I just lost him here. Tom. Uh, Tom Brady is 96. 96. Mahomes 97. <sighs> Should be a little bit lower. With I don't what care. he's got around him this year. All right, officially. Well, no, have but that's not the, that's not the point. <laughs> that's not the point. He should be a little bit lower with what he has around him this year. You're ranking purely the player. Everything in his rank. What is it? What should he drop? Like, there's no category. Wide receivers around him, <laughs> <laughs> linemen in front of him. Those aren't categories. Okay, so you agree with the rating? I don't care about the rating. Oh, I'm just okay. saying that oh, should okay. factor in. Oh, so you have an opinion. That's how you win any argument. Yeah, I'm I, a, I'm opinion, I don't care. I'm opinionless on what the rating should be. I just have an, op- an opinion on how you should get the rating. Well, funny, because this segment is actually about the ratings. Right. So my opinion is on how you should get the rating. Who he has around him shouldn't factor into what his rating is. But you don't care what the rating is. That's like saying if we were grading writers on the playbook... Julian Edlo should be downgraded because he has writers like Steve Buchanan around him. That makes no and sense. That exactly, the makes no sense. <laughs> I think that about wraps up the panel. Dude, no, you gave me a great, <laughs> a great exercise for later today. Like uh, power rankings for for playbook writers are coming out. We got a lot of guys in town. Uh, yeah, Gary and Thorne is off yep, off camera. He's here. He, Traveled from from the great up north. We tried to get him in, um, if only so I could make the joke. We're not the panel B podcast. We're not the panel A podcast because we had a Canadian. <laughs> Let that sink in. Uh. There it is. <laughs> 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 Hit him. Uh. But we can't fit a fourth person in here. So unfortunately, uh, you'll just have to see him <laughs> later on other publications. Um, you know, a long time ago, Julian mentioned long time ago being like fifteen twenty minutes ago that he felt much more comfortable talking about tonight's. Than anything tonight's yep. slate in the MLB than anything else. So We're naturally, back. we haven't talked about it at all. But we'll get mm. it in here real quick under the gun. Uh, what do you like tonight? I, I, I the first thing that stood out to me was Robbie Ray against the Rangers in Texas. Massive price jump. Uh, huge price jump. But the thing with Ray is, you never feel great about rostering him. But he is exactly the type of guy that will give you a big boomer bust score especially in tournaments, uh, going against the Rangers, who have the highest strikeout percentage in the league against lefties, is nice. Uh, obviously, Ray has some of the best strikeout potential in the league, and he's kind of settled down a bit. I mean, we've seen him We've seen him in spurts where he doesn't even go through four innings because he's already thrown 120 pitches. But uh, he's on a nice little run right now, and against a team who really struggles against lefties and strikes out a ton against them, he's 10100 tonight, which, like you mentioned, is a massive price jump for him, but he has the potential to reach value even at that high salary. I'm just checking what the weather is going to be like. Yes, yeah, that's one of the spots that <coughs> doesn't have an issue. So that's a, that's uh, another I mean, part I, of it not too. Not from a rain perspective, oh, from okay. an actual degrees perspective. Yeah, 96, 96. I mean, it's Texas. I mean, I, well, exactly. But when you get to the triple digits, the oh, ball. Oh yeah, sure, for sure. Like for anyone sure. like Robbie Ray, who's going to give up hard contact. Right. When he gives up contact, that scares yep. me. But not too hot tonight. And then from a betting perspective, Arizona only minus 124. Um, I, I love betting on lefties against the Rangers uh, for, for most of the reasons you guys just covered. But, I mean, you look at what Alex Young, um, he's gotten off to a really good start. You look at what he did to the Rangers last night, got a pretty easy win. Um, I think that that Robbie Ray is probably a little underpriced there at minus 124. Um, I think the Marlins at home at plus money have been a good bet recently in Here general. And so when you get an offense like the Padres in there, I, they were, I think they were plus two hundred yesterday and came through something, something along those lines. I might be thinking of another game, but massive difference in pitching though from last night to tonight. That's fine. I'll take Trevor <laughs> Richards against Chris Paddock. Okay. 
The only you the, take that bet. the only thing that made me mad about last night's game is that the Padres team total for against Jordan Yamamoto was four and four a half. half. I took under four and a half. Yeah. The Padres went into the ninth inning at four. And then because the Marlins already had 12 runs and gave up, they just gave up three runs and the Padres <laughs> scored seven runs. <laughs> one of many bad beats last night. That is pretty brutal. But we deserve to turn this around. Another one, Dodgers minus one and a half on the run line. They are up 8-6 oh, yeah. going into the ninth and lose 9-8. to eight. That stunk. <laughs> but looking at spots for tonight, hammering the hey, – I think there's been a lot of mismatches lately, a lot of these good teams facing really bad teams. And yeah, one I that highlights that. that the most – Indians and Tigers. Uh, um, Mike Clevenger totally. on the mound. I think that's a place that we can look at the run line for the Cleveland Indians. I agree with that. Um, who have been dominating the Tigers in this series. I think last night was 8 nothing. Moving um, up in the standings. Moving up in the standings. Some of us might have twins futures that matter <laughs> a lot. Um, <laughs> but I like, nonetheless, a lot to like about the Indians in this spot. Bukes, anything you want to add? No, I, I, I like the Dodgers a lot, too. Uh, Dodgers a lot tonight as well against uh, Nick. Nick Pavetta. Just got to watch that weather in Philly as well. Yeah, I mean, it's a weather trouble spot, but, you know, Nick Pavetta has just been downright brutal as of late, especially at home. And I actually didn't even realize this until I was researching today's slate. I didn't realize how bad the Phillies' bullpen has been. They're actually mm-hmm. amongst the worst, worst in the league uh, and one of the worst at home, too, as well. Uh, I, that's... I'm actually a little disappointed in myself that I haven't realized that sooner because that's definitely an area that you want to take advantage of. I think we get a lot more chatter about bullpens lately. I think it has a lot to do with how we have openers a lot more, so we see a lot of the bullpens now. So people kind of catching on to targeting uh, opposing teams' bullpens, but I didn't realize how bad the Phillies have been. And, you know, being the middle of July to just kind of catch on to that, I'm a little disappointed in myself in, but... At least we know now. So <laughs> that's I mean that's actually now that we're in this you know midsummer stage where things are kind of slower around yeah. the sports calendar like that's not a bad thing to discuss on on one of these podcasts is because bullpens have never been more important to handicap towards sure. towards betting and to factor in towards stacking. We always look at that who who's starting against them if you're stacking this team. Well, this guy might go four innings and then you get five innings of this bullpen. So I, I just yep. think bullpens over these last couple of seasons with openers with less expected of starters in terms of workload and innings that how you you know breaking down these bullpens is has become more and more important without yeah. a doubt talked about it on mlb network on monday that was my well, main i point. missed that, that was, good yeah. flex <laughs> good go flex. ahead of the curve nice flex <laughs> yeah. get this man a check mark well i was Stealing gonna say thunder. yeah i mean if you stuck around to the 30 minute mark here this podcast hi mom and uh yeah <laughs> uh we got we got some good actionable info there you're 100 percent right and i think the other thing that i always focus on more so after the trade deadline i would say but it's just motivation and and where these teams are at and the phillies yeah. Uh, holding that second wild card spot right now, half game above the Brewers, so uh, definitely in the race. They're going to make some changes to that bullpen, obviously. Then, yep. Uh, so you need to pay attention to that when it comes. But in the meantime, you know, if they have a starter that you like, it helps you a little bit in that they might stretch that guy out a little bit more. They don't trust that bullpen. They're going to have him go that extra inning if he can make it, absolutely, and then get you a couple more DK points. That was, I mean, that was the. The Indians, was it last year, like had so many bullpen issues. Yes. So their starters would just pitch forever. <laughs> and it was great. Like you could always bake in, like, okay, if he's just, if he's pitching okay, like he doesn't even have to be pitching great, he's going seven or eight innings. Uh, so we'll see, you know, maybe if that trend continues or if the Phillies just make some moves. Obviously, bullpen's the one thing that every team who's in contention is going to be looking to shore up. Uh, but so many teams are just going to be willing to part with guys. Uh, <laughs> left and right. Unless so. you're the Red Sox and keep insisting that you don't need bullpen help because Nathan Ivaldi is three weeks away from being three weeks away from being three weeks away from being the closer. Well, I heard they... Don't. Let's, let's wrap don't. this up. Let's, let's, let's <laughs> tie a bow on this, come around full circle. They did make a move, and that is for Andrew Cashner. I'm going to close my computer. <laughs> we are done here. This is Panel B. End of Alex. show. This is the second time I'm doing this. Thank you for tuning in to the Panel B podcast. For Alex Jankowski, for Julie Hedlow, I'm Steve Buchanan. See ya. <laughs>